Every year, approximately three and a half million people fly in and out of Halifax Stanfield International Airport. Like many airports, they have expanded on security by employing a specially trained detection dog. This is my uh, police service dog, Doc. We're here at Halifax Robert L. Stanfield International Airport where the two of us are responsible for an explosive profile here. Doc is uh, he's a very young dog. He just graduated in May. He's only 20 months old, uh, purebred German Shepherd. I have what's called a specialty dog, which means him and I look for bombs and nothing else. Our world is explosive. This dog doesn't bite. He doesn't track people. He doesn't look for articles lost in a murder scene or anything like that, although I'm training him to do that for fun. But his <laughs> world, his world is simply explosive. Our world is simply explosives. Uh, 55 days of training once I started him on the explosive profile. Three weeks of testing after that, and he got validated in May. So he's a full-fledged uh, RCMP police dog right now. Go do some work. We have eight profiles in the explosive world that our dogs have to pass. Things like, you know, searching vehicles, searching aircraft, cargo, um, and that's what we'll be tested on. You know, they'll take us to a cargo facility or we'll go into an aircraft and they'll put hides out that we don't know where they are and they'll say, okay, search it, tell us what you find. And it's our job to find everything that's in there. You know, if they put three hides out, they expect me to find three hides in that cargo facility or in the aircraft. In New Glasgow, Dwayne is preparing his first police service dog for life after work. Even with only a few months of service remaining, Eco must continue his training. Normally when we're out like this, you see me working with him here, sending him out after the ball, getting him to sit, heel. We're actually training, but it's in a more relaxed atmosphere, so he really doesn't think we're training. It's just constant reinforcement. You stop practicing well, your skills get worse, so you try to stay on it all the time to keep sharp. You know, that's what he's here for. He's here to do a job. And to keep doing a great job, Eco needs to stay in good health. He's a puppy at heart, but the reality is he's getting older. And it's Dwayne's job to keep an eye out for potential problems. Check his legs, you know, feel his hips, and just to see if he has any sore spots. He's, he's getting at the end, end of his working career. You want to make sure that he's, he's good and healthy. You want to give them some measure of life after they retire. Uh, most big dogs, you get maybe 10 or 12 years out of them, so he works fairly hard, so his hips are still good, and his health is good, so uh, I'm hoping we get through without him having any issues, and then he'll retire and I'll keep him at home with the rest of my brood of dogs. While Eco enjoys his golden years, Dwayne will be training a new puppy who will live and work with him and each day he will leave his partner of nine years at home. It's a tough transition for both the dog and the handler, and it just might be the hardest part of the job. I retired my guy at eight years of age because of a medical reason. That's a, that's a bad day when he can't come to work with you anymore. Yeah. Brian and Phelan were partners for many years, and while their working relationship has come to an end, the bond they share will live on. And he's now at home and the little guy comes with me and um, that bond will come with, with Doc and I as well. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it gets very tight between you and your dog. He's your best friend. For Phelan and Eco, retirement means they can put their paws up and relax. We have the option when they retire, whether or not we keep the dog, if we have the time and, and space for them. Um, the dogs can be adopted by a family, uh, obviously to a home approved by us, um, or the dog is put down for medical reasons, no different than you would for your own dog if it was ailing. Uh, like I said, he's, he's been a really good dog. You have to try and wind him down a little bit to get him used to being at home. So now I'm trying to slide him into the dog world where he can actually socially interact with the other three. He's never been a house dog, he's never been a pet. He was, let's like, say, 11 months old, 12 months old when he came here, so he's had no real uh, domestic life like my other dogs have. You get to read each other so much, like you don't even have to say anything, it's just, just a look. 
And that's from being together for seven years. Most dog handlers, you'll spend more going? time with your dog than you do your family. What dog? Sometimes it's these animals, uh, they die. It's bad enough when it's a family pet, but when you have an animal that you train as a partner, it would be even more difficult. Put a lot of pressure on these dogs when they go into training. We, we demand a lot of them. I guess uh, in the police work, we demand a lot of the police officers, so we do the same with the dogs. Over their career, a police service dog handler will be partnered with several working dogs. With each new dog, the job of training begins again. Looking back, many handlers hold a place in their heart for that one dog that stood out from the rest, the one they will never forget. For Corporal Rick Mosier, that dog was Bandit. He had no, uh, no fear whatsoever. He was 65 pounds, little dog. Everybody made fun of him, but uh, Bandit was the best dog I've ever had. Every retired dog handler I've ever talked to over the years, they all have one dog that makes it for them. And uh, for me, it was Bandit and I always will be. Rick Mosier and Bandit have worked together for two years, when on June 25th, 2000, they were called to apprehend an armed suspect who had barricaded himself at home in the community of George's River on Cape Breton Island. The response team still hadn't arrived on scene at five o'clock when the individual actually came out of the house, didn't have the rifle, didn't see any other weapons on him. Took a couple steps towards me, he looked at the dog, bandit took off right after him, and I didn't even have to tell him what to do. He knew he had stopped this guy. Uh, when he ran, he pulled the line right out of my hand and uh, grabbed him, knocked him down. I got there and I was reaching in to help bandit and get this guy cuffed. He got up on his knees and he pulled out a, a large knife. And uh, at that time he did stab the dog I screamed at the dog to come back, and then uh, came to my heel, laid down beside me. Uh, he just continued to uh, come towards me with the knife. Just before he got to me, with the last swing towards me, the bandit uh, hit him again, hit him, and he, and he put his left arm down. The dog grabbed him, swung him around, and then as he did that, he swung him around. He came around with the knife in his right hand and stabbed him right in the side and they got him right through the heart. He was able to crawl back to me, but I could hear his last breath when he lay down beside me at that time. Mortally wounded after the first attack, somehow, Bandit continued to defend his partner. He knew I was in trouble. He knew that uh, Dad's in trouble, I gotta, I gotta fight this guy. That's loyalty for you. Like he just gave up his life to save mine. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Sometimes I, you know people might laugh at me, but I think uh, you know there's a guardian angel there that was sent to me that day. <laughs> he was a little brown dog named Bandit. After Bandit was uh, uh, was killed, the community was quite involved in, in what took place after that. Uh, it donated. Uh, a stone, a memorial for Bandit and with inscription and they actually etched his uh, face on it and that's right in front of the North Sydney office and uh, that's where we had a memorial service uh, for Bandit and uh, quite a few dog handlers came from all over Eastern Canada and municipal police forces all attended. In the town of Bass River, Nova Scotia is the Forgotten Heroes Monument. On July 1st, 2012, the memorial was unveiled in memory of all handlers and animals who served in Canada's military and police services. Forgotten Heroes began as a school project by an inspiring 12-year-old, Noah Tremblay. The first memorial of its kind in the country is now filled with the names of animal heroes who served Canada. Corporal Rick Mosier and Bandit are one of the dog teams honored. We started a, a project for a memorial for, for animals that were killed in war action. He's also dedicated to uh, serving uh, police dogs as well. We went over the day for the ceremony to open it and, uh, you know, quite proud of the, of the young fella to take the initiative. I've known more than a few dogs 
to die either at the moment, um, and a lot of our dogs have gotten significantly hurt that they had to be euthanized, both in disaster and and in uh, the avalanche field. They've gotten badly enough hurt where they can go on, and for some young man to uh, to give him that honor is, uh, I'm very grateful to him, and I'm very impressed that somebody that young can do something like that. There's a time where he could jump up on my shoulders, but not anymore. From our earliest days together, dogs have been a tremendous asset. Their strength, drive, and other incredible abilities seem to be naturally designed to improve our lives. As this partnership continues to grow and evolve, we will find new and unique ways for dogs to contribute to our society. Who's to say what dogs will be doing for us in the future? But without a doubt, dogs will be there by our side, protecting us, watching our back, and being our best friends.